Hello and welcome. Welcome to Ask the Trainer, this week's edition. And I'm joined, as usual, by the regular training team from Maxon with two special editions. We're delighted to welcome both Adrian from Technical Support at Redshift and also Thanasis, aka Noseman. So welcome, everybody. Hello. Hey there. And regular viewers will know that this is the point where I like to show you all the various things that we're doing and share that we're recording. So I'll try and be quick because we've got loads of interesting things to talk about because Redshift is our theme this week, off the heels of the newly released Redshift for Mac. And so uh, hello to Barry from Bristol, Brizzle, I should say, in the UK. Hi there. Hopefully you're having some sunshine this time of year. But here we go, this is the Maxon events page. So if you go to maxon.net and click on the events button, so it's under, under news here, then you see all the shiny events that we're running. And we are running Ask the Trainer all the way through the year. So every second and fourth Thursday of the month, and we're having different themes for it. But also we run the demystifying sessions too. So on Monday, we'll be delving further into visualization for Cinema 4D and a bit of redshift in there too and also some of the new tools in S24. And Jonas will be showing you how to set up your own car rig with the new car rig tools inside Cinema. So that's very exciting. And also we are recording these sessions, as probably many of you know. If you head over to the Maxon training team on YouTube, then you see all the sessions that we upload afterwards. And also, as well as the webinar recordings, we put up lots of quick tips. So that's really useful for just rewinding and seeing some techniques again. Plus, if you wanted to have a reminder of this link inside the website or the, the webinar application, you can see a link at the handouts button where you can download the uh, Ask the Trainer Redshift Links PDF. And that's got all the links that we're talking about today, including that I added in a link there for some of the UI improvements inside Redshift, and that's on the Redshift forums. So you'll find that link in there too, as well as the link to the recording. And you'll also find the link to the fact that we're delighted that you're joining us on this session. So um, what we used to do in real life, back, back when real life was a thing, we would hand out t-shirts if you came with visitors, us at an event. So we'd like to do a similar thing. So thank you for coming on live for this session. So if you go to the merch store, and that link is in the PDF, and we'll also post it in the chat too, and you put in the password visualization, then you can claim your very own uh, Red Giant or Redshift or Cinema 4D or even in fact a Maxon logo uh, t-shirts. So we just want to have a free t-shirt to give you. All you have to pay for is the shipping, which is about $3 or three or four euros, depending on where you are. Fantastic, great. So I think I think that's it. Great. Yes. So what we're going to do this week is it's an open session. So it's whatever questions you've got, we want to answer. And we definitely have the brain trust with us. So please feel free to jump in any question, especially if it's Redshift themed about all the, the tools that we do at Maxon. And whilst you're considering what question you'd like to ask, um, I'm going to ask one of our team a question because it's quite interesting that we got this new version out on the Mac. So uh, I know, Ellie, you were playing with the Mac version um, a little of last week or over the last few weeks, in fact. So uh, the, I'd like to ask you if there are any things that you felt that jumped out at you um, and things that you found useful about it. Yeah, so yeah, I've been kind of like learning Redshift over the last kind of five or six months. And yeah, this new release um, in particular, I'm loving the new UI. I think kind of like artist and user friendly is definitely like the way that this kind of like these changes have gone. Um, and in particular, you now have a basic tab. So you have like a basic and advanced tab um, within kind of like the Redshift settings, which let me, shall I share my screen? Right, let's let's, let's have you share your screen. I'll send let's the screen that. to you here we go, to presenter, make you presenter on here. Uh, cool, right. Um, let me know when you can see my screen. Hasn't popped up yet. It hasn't, has it? Oh, there we go. Great. Okay. Right. Cool. We got it. Cool. Here we go. Cool. Right. So if I just open up my render settings, and I've got my render set to Redshift. So we now have um, a basic tab and an advanced tab. 
Uh, so before you kind of had access to just the one tab and you had a whole bunch of um, settings. Now, what's what, what my favorite thing uh, about this kind of new, new release is this basic tab. So as kind of an existing user or a new user, um, straight off the bat, we can just kind of render using these settings here. So, you know, your bucket quality is, these are like presets now. So with my medium tab selected, I can just render out um, as it is, I've got global illumination um, on by default and on automatic sampling, and I'll get like a medium quality render out of Redshift without having to worry about kind of a whole bunch of settings uh, that I may, like personally may not have understood um, before. Um, so that for me, I think is like the biggest change um, and things like, so your global illumination, if we come into our advanced tab, we can see um, kind of what default settings we're using. Um, so this is, you know, brute force and IPC, but these can be changed. Um, so if I change this to brute force, come back to my basic tab, we can see we've got some modified settings here. Um, so yeah for me especially like this is this is super handy um as like i said a new user or existing user and you still have access to all the stuff that you had beforehand so for example like automatic sampling if you switch that off we've got all of our overrides here which we can switch on and drop down and change our samples for um so all the existing stuff is still in there it's now just kind of slightly reworded and uh, slightly kind of located in a more user-friendly way Nice. That's one of the things that people have asked me when they're learning Redshift has been, <laughs> how do I render faster? And the answer is, it depends. And then we get into the different elements of where do you change the settings and how many samples and in the GI, the difference between brute force and the other settings. So it's nice that you can just get a, um, a render more quickly out of the box as you're developing your knowledge. But another question that comes up quite often would you mind going back to that, um, the GI settings were for brute force? Yeah. Um, and this is an open question for everyone um, as well. Um, on that primary GI engine, if you can click on that drop down, Ellie, where it says yeah. brute force, when would we use the different ones and what do they mean? That's another question that pops up a lot. Can I jump in? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, feel free. Great, Adrian, Someone else, please jump in. <laughs> Adrian, who works um, at technical support in Redshift, is probably well well qualified to answer this. Yes. Okay, so Iridian's cache is used mostly for flat surfaces. It's a point cloud technique, so we're shooting rays kind of randomly everywhere, and we're pretty much collecting the data around the points, and we're making a, a big point cloud, and we use that to uh, simulate GI if you want. But there's a small issue with Iridian's cache. It's really fast on flat surfaces with really low detail. But the minute you have detail, that speed advantage vanishes. For instance, you don't want to use Iridian's cache for plants, which have small leaves and so on and so forth, or for really fine displaced geometry because the Iridian's cache will have a really hard time to figure out all the detail inside the actual geometry. So you're gonna end up with something splotchy. But for architectural and flat surfaces, absolutely great. That's why we, we do by default brute, uh, brute force IPC, which is a kind of a compromise between brute force brute force, which will give you everything it will be slower, but it will be precise. Brute force IPC is somewhere in between IC IPC and brute force brute force. So it, it, it gives you the speed of a point cloud with a bit of brute force, the precision of brute force. Is that right. and on, good enough? Engine, on, Ellie, would you mind clicking on the drop down for the secondary engine? And so, okay, great. So there's, and if you can mix and match those, Adrian? Or would yes. you recommend um, recommend any situation where you'd have to have them the same? Um, there are situations when even um, IPC doesn't really cope with the with the actual scene, where even IPC might get splotchy, might um, vibrate a bit, you know, like uh, it flick, it might flicker, right? And that, at that point, you need the brute force brute force approach. One thing you might notice, though, in these two primary and secondary GI engines, 
There's no more photon mapping. Yay, we got rid of that. <laughs> We're using photons for caustic zone. Anyway, nobody was using photon mapping. I mean, this is something which we, we started in 2012, 2013, something like that, when photon mapping was still something. Not anymore. So yeah, I would so like to bring I would like to bring some perspective in this whole uh, debacle. Uh, up until five years ago, renderings were about a thousand times slower. So just put it on brute force, brute force, and you'll still be a thousand times faster than anything you've ever seen in your lives. <laughs> we're trying to nitpick uh, irradiance cache, as uh, Adrian uh, said, is very good for architectural design and all that. And man, cards are so fast these days, and Redshift is so well optimized and all that. Just put it on maximum. It's like playing a game on your new uh, GPU. Put it on maximum settings, you know, and you can generate some heat for your feet. It's still <laughs> cold here. It's snowed yesterday. That's why I'm saying that. <laughs> Well, I Brian's got, Brian's in fact, uh, Brian probably was thinking of that exact question as you were saying this, Thanesis, because he was asking to follow up on that point about brute force and brute force. Um, and he says he's trying to understand what the second pass does and when to use it. So bearing in mind the, <laughs> the advice, just stick it on brute force. Uh, what is the second pass doing? A uh, question for me uh, or Adrian? I, either or. Uh, you, you first, Thanesis. <laughs> okay, when we talk about uh, GI compared to uh, traditional, let's say, non-GI renders, uh, the only light we get is the light which is directly coming from light sources. With the uh, GI, global illumination, the, the global part of global illumination comes from how light bounces off an object and onto another object. I'm not talking about reflections, I'm talking about the diffuse light. So essentially, there, there's a, a point where the renderer calculates the direct light from the light sources on the surfaces of the objects. And then we have all the consequent bounces uh, that happen and how those are calculated. So with GI, you just extend the amount of light bouncing. That's why it's slower than if you put standard renderer and just render shiny cubes without any global illumination. Uh, and that's what the, the, the uh, secondary bounces are it's the bounces that are not the, the light that's not generated by the light sources itself but is generated by the bouncing of light on surfaces and uh, maybe there's some more technical details i'm very happy for adrian to so add to that just just to add a bit um, let's imagine the first thing uh, you have primary and secondary rays primary rays are starting from the camera and they're hitting an object in the scene there you can have reflections, refraction, whatever, right? And depending on the intensity of the uh, actual diffuse you're, or even reflections, okay, you can get secondary rays. So that will be the first the primary rays hit the surface. They detect where it is and they detect what's happening further. The secondary rays, as I said, can be refraction, refraction, uh, whatever you have, but also GI. So the first primary engine for GI is the primary ray hitting the surface and generating one ray. And that will go wherever it can go, right? Depending on the surface normal and so on and so forth. And then it will hit another surface. That's primary GI engine. When it hits another surface, it can trigger secondary rays. And that is secondary engine. Basically, just strip down, think it, uh, of it like this. One bounce equals primary GI engine. More than that equals secondary as well. Is that is enough? I mean, you can see that if you're, if you're turning the bounces from four to zero, you're gonna notice that the secondary GI engine is disabled. Try that. Yeah. See? Okay, it's, it cannot be zero, right? You have one bounce coming from the primary GI engine. When you have another bounce, then you have secondary GI engine kicking in. Great stuff. And Brian, Brian's folded up and saying, cheers, thanks guys. So that's, ex that's excellent info. So the, that's useful when you're doing multiple bounces and then going back to Thanasis's point, just set it on brute force. <laughs> And it used to be go away and have a cup of tea, but I have to be quick now because it's so so fast. 
Um, Garrett's asking on the basic mode about the, the number of samples. So on the basic mode, does the system keep the math divisible by two, like you would do on an advanced setting, making sure local samples are higher than unified? No, 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 no. By default, the basic, if you have automatic sampling on, in this case, in exactly this render settings, the, uh, the uh, yeah, automatic sampling is off. When you have it on, there's a small logic happening for each pixel. So it gets analyzed, it gets the, the uh, adaptive error threshold, which is called threshold here, because we renamed this to make it more artist friendly. Previously, there were like programmer logic. Now it's more artist logic, you know. And uh, what's happening is for each pixel, the engine will detect this adaptive threshold and then it will decide, do I need more samples in this or that area? Meaning maybe it needs more on GI, maybe it needs more on refraction or reflection, depending on the shader and the lights in the scene around, right? So, and that's really, really easy because to be honest, these days, all I have to do is fire up Redshift and just hit low, medium or high, depending what I want to do. Really, nothing else. Before you had to go and enable GI, fiddle a bit of with the, with the uh, actual samples, then try to hunt down the, uh, the uh, automatic sampling in the system, experimental options. Now it's just straight. Basic, that's it. Nice. We really try to make it straight for the user, you know, just enable Redshift and that's it. And if you want it a bit faster or a bit slower or a bit better looking, just click some buttons, which are those above the, on the, the, the bucket quality. That's it. And one more thing that I like to point out, if you're opening the bucket quality here, there's a small, uh, bigger sign, right? You see that we have a threshold. Now this used to be really from zero to one linear and 0 0.01 was really, really, really close to the left. Now it's an exponential slider, which means that you can really fine tune your samples. See, it's half the way of the actual um, whole slider is 0 0.01 and then it ends up at one to the, to the right. So this is exponential, actually it's even, it's not quite exponential, it's even more. But this allows you to fine tune your threshold to whatever you want, right? And you see that you know, when you hit some values, you have very high, high, medium and low. For instance, I like to start with low because this is super fast. And then if I need to go up a bit, medium and high, and that's about it. I mean, it's, it's a no brainer to be honest. Nice. That's so what a, that's what nice Adrian question. is trying to say, sorry for interjecting, and this is a reply to uh, Garrett directly, is that, so this has happened, so you don't have to ask these questions. So that's uh, <laughs> precisely the point. <laughs> yeah. I personally think that, especially the introduction of the automatic sampling was uh, like the biggest milestone in the last years of um, Redshift development in terms of um, yeah user value um, because really before you had to to tweak so many settings in so many different places and now you just yeah have it enabled and yeah you're just good to go it's um, as Adrian said it's it's a no-brainer you you set your render engine to Redshift and you just start rendering without exactly. thinking about all of this other stuff that's amazing. Yeah? Now, we, we try to optimize what we consider as basic or general and whatever it's advanced. So when you start this experience, this Redshift experience, it's straight on good. Fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Um, Anders is um, just commenting, love your discussion. Thanks, for Anders. is asking for, is this version available as a demo? I believe it is because the demo has been available for some time now. Um, no, Adrian, it's not. Is this is this the, the new demo for three? Is that available? No, 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 no. This happened in three zero forty four, which is the last version we we shipped okay. about a week or two or something like that. 
The last demo we have is 3036, which doesn't have this new UI. Now, this new UI was uh, was actually um, conceptualized, if you want, for S24. So we had to wait until S24 ships to change this. And this will actually go into all the DCCs. This is this won't be uh, C4 the only. Every other supported DCC will have the exact same feel. So if you're jumping to something else, you will know where to find them. That's useful. Peter's been waiting patiently. Thanks, Peter. And hello to you. He's in Los Angeles. And he's asking, in a Redshift light shader graph, how can I use the color user data node to vary color and intensity across MoGraph, MoGraph clones of the light? Or are there some other ways to do this? I actually started putting together uh, an example for that, and I found that it did not, uh, it, it, that it's not working as I initially thought. Um, can I share my screen and yeah, uh, see what Adrian yeah, would suggest I change? Okay, uh, just to, while you're doing all this, I'm going to explain one thing. Uh, light instancing is not directly supported in Russia. So okay. what you're doing, you're going to use a MoGraph uh, effector to affect the actual light or to inject, sorry, uh, to inject colors into the uh, cloner, let's say, right? And what you can do then, you can grab the user data that's coming from the cloner as color. So if you're going, for instance, to the cloner and then uh, to the can you click on the cloner? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Objects. And you can see, uh, you don't, can you? I don't know if that works. Uh, try, try a random cloner with nothing. A random, sorry, a random effector with nothing. With nothing or in like, the cloner? No, no, no. Just okay. add them in there. A random. Okay. No PRS or anything. Okay. For the parameters. All these are off, right? All we yeah. need is a color mode. So okay, if you're going so go down to color modes, which I don't know, go back to okay. object here, uh, random. Okay, exactly. So you're gonna get the effector color. Okay, and then you choose a blending mode. Hmm. Whatever you want, add, subtract, multiply, divide doesn't okay. really matter. Then you will be able to use it. All right, but the default, no. It's okay to default. Okay, all right. Whatever, it's just an option. Huh, okay. It well, doesn't have to do anything. It just injects color data into your cloner. Um, okay, so the color data is in the cloner. Um, can, but you're saying we can't get that into like this visible area, this, this sphere? Yeah, this is not rendering, right? No, it's rendering through the viewport IPR, right? Yes. Can you refresh that? Yeah. It's uh, refreshing. It is, it's, we're at 2 per, 3%. No, it doesn't matter. It's black anyway, right? Uh, yeah, let's, here, let me do something a little different. In the random, I'm going to uh, set it to uh, field color because I have, um and then i'll add this uh with a it has a purple here and let's refresh force a refresh huh. it's still black what yeah. options do you have in an attribute name you're on rsmg color right uh which options do i have where if you're if you're in the shader graph for the attribute yeah, name, there's so, a small drop-down menu on the right. I have the MoGraph color for the... Okay, there's a small drop-down menu. If you're clicking on that, what you get? Yeah. Color, index ratio, objects. Okay, yeah. try the uh, display color. I think that should might hmm. work. Okay. That'd be interesting. One of these things, I don't know, it's... I have to 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 probably open and see and look for this. 
But if this doesn't work, it's because we don't support instancing, like instancing in Redshift, right? So this okay. is an actual hack. Um, now, I'll, I'll, look, I'll, while you're talking about things, I'm going to make a scene for you. And uh, we can get back to this, right? Excellent. This is perfect. Excellent. Excellent. That's that's exactly why we plan these sessions so we can be interactive like this because that's yeah. that's the sort of thinking process that often we have when we're on jobs and try. How do we get around this? So that'd be brilliant. Thank you, Agent. Um, there's another question. Um, Glenn asked a few minutes ago in the original Redshift node editor, will there ever, ever be a shortcut key to be able to preview the node you are working on only? Wow. Um, as well as well as other shortcut keys to connect and disconnect nodes. So that's you mean the solo that's... mode. Oh, you can if you're soloing the node editor in node in the node editor, you can get the current node, isn't that? Uh, in the Cinema 4D nodes, yeah, there's a there's a solo. And for the shader graph, if he wants to do the shader graph, we have a, a shortcut for that, which is Q. Oh, really? Yeah, it's you click Q and it connects actually Q, well, whatever you make it, sorry. Uh, you just set a shortcut for the command to connect node to output. Let's close this and go. If you're going, if you're opening Redshift, um, Shader graph. There we go. Not the node editor. Yeah, here's here we go with shader graph. Okay, there's a small menu called tools in the window. There you go. Connect node to output. And because mm -hmm. this is a command, you can assign whatever you want. I have it on Q for yeah. instance. Yeah, I actually haven't done it since I got on this desktop, but um, the way to do exactly that is uh, you go to customize commands. This has every single command and object and, and some 40 tool, whatever. Um, and know what you're looking for. So here it's connect node to output. So in that customize commands name filter, begin to type that connect node to, oh, here we go. So here's connect node to output, and I will go down to the shortcut where it's blank, and I will choose control enter, and then I will click assign. And so now that is my keyboard shortcut. So I can choose uh, this node and hit control enter, and it just connects it to the uh, surface output. That's right. Or I could go to this texture, control enter, control, or Adrian said he uses the Q key. Um, so, and then, yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's how I essentially solo or, or, or preview my, uh, textures or yeah. nodes or materials. Glenn's just asking, you may have answered this, Darren, but Glenn's just asking to double check, where can you find those shortcut keys? Yeah. So if you go to your main menus up top to window, customization and customize commands. You can also get to this with uh, Shift F12, or if you right click in most icon palettes, you will find uh, a customize palettes thing, which when you select it, brings up this window um, with this option enabled, uh, which allows you to drag and drop those commands into the interface uh, but anyway um yeah so short answer <laughs> sorry window customization customize commands fantastic and ben's just come back with a follow-up comment saying it'd be making this much faster to preview um can you do the same thing you're just showing to connect and disconnect nodes discon well, why would you want to disconnect, disconnect i mean yeah. you always need something on the surface I think perhaps so to... when he's experimenting to do a, a keyboard shortcut to disconnect a node more quickly. Well, just connect something different. Um, yeah, it. I don't know that that would. It's an it's an interesting request. I I don't know when I'd want to do that. 
I mean, uh -huh. okay, you disconnect it and you end up with nothing in the surface. And that's not helpful because you're going to end up with red, <laughs> which is the color that we use for offending shaders. And of course, uh, C4D will actually uh, throw an error saying, well, illegal material, blah, 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 blah. So you, you always want something connected to the material surface. Got it. To be honest, I never had this issue. I mean, I never had to disconnect it. If I want to, I always want to connect something to the output, right? Um, yeah, otherwise you, you see nothing. There's, yeah, it's, it's like creating a material, but not putting a, a material on an object. It, exactly. Um, not, I'm not sure where the value would be in it, in, in doing that. Uh, but there it is. may just be a lack of imagination a... on my part. Surely not. Um, the, um, Jonas, you had a nice example of some procedural textures in Redshift. And just whilst Adrian's um, playing around with that other scene that we were talking yeah. about a few minutes ago, would you mind uh, sharing how you set that up? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, While well, Jonas is sharing his screen, I'd just uh, like to reply to Peter that I just realized that if you use Cinema 4D lights, not Redshift lights, under a cloner, they actually work properly uh, with, um, you know, effectors. You can colorize the lights using effectors. So there are limitations because you don't have access to all the parameters of a Redshift light. But if lighting is your only concern, just drop a Cinema 4D light under a cloner, and uh, then any effector that affects the, the color, and uh, you will get colorized lights. I love this material, Jonas. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so this is a material that I created for um, a train track. And as you can see, or let me, let me just render it a little bit um, so we can see all of the surface details. Um, and this is completely procedural. I, I didn't use any textures on this one. So we have um, noises here um, for the basic like uh, structure of the surface and then there is also like an iron part here on on top because usually um, rail tracks are a little bit more clean and i also have got this like um distorted mask here or like yeah like a like a worn edge uh, mask so to speak and yeah let, let me break down this material a little bit so i'm going to go to my notes layout and here you can see the notes graph so this whole whilst thing is in, whilst you're in there Jonas sorry to interrupt we had a yeah. side question which would actually fit into what you're about to show from our good friend and master trainer Oliver Loeza hey Oliver and he's hey, asking, does the hey, road editor have exactly the same functions as the shader graph? Is there a difference? Are there nodes that exist in one place and not in another? Uh, yes, um, there is a difference. Um, first of all, workflow-wise, um, but there are some nodes um, uh, which you can't use here in the Cinema 4D node editor, uh, but in the Redshift shader graph. So if you want to have the full functionality of the nodes, you should, um, um, for now, um, yeah, use the Redshift shader graph um, uh, instead of Cinema 4D nodes, um, such as the the Cinema 4D um, shader node, for example. Um, this one is not supported here in um, um, in the node editor, but in the Redshift shader graph. And uh, but there are. Yeah, and, and the whole uh, Expresso functionality is missing. You can bring in um, user data um, into this node, node graph as well, but um, the workflow is a little bit different. All right, so yeah, let me break this down a little bit. Um, first of all, what we have here, let's, let's just talk about the color. So everything that goes into um, that goes this way up here. So I'm using three different noises, this one, this one, and that one, 
and I combine these here um, in the uh, in the color layer node. And let me make this a little bit bigger, or maybe even fold this away and also fold this one away so we have a little bit more space for the attributes manager. So yeah, we've got the base layer. Um, and the cool thing is that you can like layer with different blend modes, of course. So what I did here is I just like, created the, the second um, layer and if I disable it and enable it, you can see uh, the difference between the two. You could just mix them like so, but um, I think it's always better to like use one of the blend modes. And what I really like is that once you use this menu, you can just use the up and down buttons to like go through all of the blend modes here. And the one I really liked uh, for this particular case is um, a difference. And I just brought down the um, the mask opacity here a bit, and then I just added um, another layer. Uh, this time the blend mode um, was color dodge. Um, I just think that this was the most beautiful. That was an uh, artistic choice rather than correct or not correct. And then I threw the whole thing into a ramp and colorized it using this gradient here, so we get this rusty color. And after that, I added another noise, this one here, which is um, stretched in Y direction. So we get these little streaks here to, to uh, get some more weathering in there. And then I added that into another color layer. And you cannot see it too much, just a little bit in the color because it's, um, um, I'm using it more in the reflection weight. And if I unsolo this one, you can see that um, these are the spots coming from this last noise, from this stretch noise that I showed you. And these are affecting the strength of the, um, of the reflection. And then I was using the same noise, like this one here, as a bump map. Oh, wait, this is the roughness map, but I also use it in the bump. And the last thing that is quite interesting is that I didn't just use the rust material, but I also created an iron material. This is just the iron preset. It's well nothing too fancy for now. Um, but the interesting thing is I was using the material blender node to blend between the two materials. And the way this node works, let me just mute my mask here is that we've got two layers of material one is the rust one is the iron and based on the blend color um, we blend between the two of course we should unsolo this node in order to make this effect visible so when it's white it's going to show the iron and when i bring it down to black it's going to show the rust but if i input um a mask and i created this mask here for that um then you can yeah like yeah just use this mask to blend between those two materials and can you, can you show you us the curvature because i think yeah. that's a, a an, an awesome amazing note that we get from redshift that we don't um it is so otherwise here's in cinema here's the curvature node. And let me just um, fold this away or just yeah, bring it back, but just get rid of the connection. The curvature node allows you to create a mask for either the convex parts of the model or the concave parts. And you can then use that to um, yeah, just refine the masks because what we have here, um, let me see the, yeah, this radius parameter. Um, you can bring that up or down to create very, very sharp um, edge masks or very wide edge masks. What I did was I used this map here to define um, the radius. So I just input this into the curvature node 
into general radius. And yeah, here we go. That's that's the the edge then. So we've got a distorted edge, which is looking much more natural. And then I was just like layering this stuff up here. So basically what I have in here is um, the gradient. Well, I cannot see it. Let's solo this one. Yeah, that was that was something I had before. Here we go. Now we can see it again. Um, so I'm using this ramp to mask the upper part, and then in the color layer, I want to solo this one. Well, something is not working here for some reason. Is it that the other? Oh, it is. It is working. I just disabled yeah. the um, the other layers. Um, yeah, I was just using a noise on top of that. So the very same noise that I used before, like this one, and just put it on top in burn mode. So again, I was just uh, going through all of these uh, modes and I just wanted to show this, uh, to make this noise showing up in those areas where I have um, like the gradient from white to black, but not the white areas and not the black areas of the, of the gradient. And this one, which was burn, seemed to be the, the best one because it, it's really detailed and really sharp and uh, just, yeah, it's, it looks cool. Quick question for you. Um, yes. um, Alexis is asking, what's the shortcut to toggle between modes? Um, well, once you once you um, had once you had this um, this drop down active, you can just use the up and down key to okay. like go through these through these modes. Yeah, and then I just added the curvature map on top of that um, using add mode. And yeah, then just piping this into the material blender um, blend color. And then you end up with um, a little bit of metalness here on these edges. But the main thing I wanted to achieve in this material um, is um, like this effect here on top. And if you want me to, I can also share this file with you guys. Well, that would be wonderful. Yes, please. I think so, the answer yeah, to can you share your file, it, or would you like me to share the file, is always yes. <laughs> yeah. It, it's interesting, Glenn's um, jumping in with his favorite node, he likes curvature. I think um, Darren, by the sounds of it, likes the color layer node. So maybe we should have a quiz, <laughs> your, your favorite Redshift nodes. Mine yeah. is actually the Material Blender, or any node that has the word Blender in it. Those are my favorites, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, that, those allow for a lot of flexibility, which is which is quite amazing. Totally. Mine is but, the OSL shader. What was that? Ah, the OSL shader. The oh, OSL shader. Yeah, that's nice. that's also a new one, which which has been added to um to the latest release of, of Redshift. Adrian, do you have um any examples that you can share, maybe, or because I don't have any? Uh, yeah, actually, we have a GitHub page with examples for uh, different shaders that you can use. You can, of course, uh, if you're willing to spend a bit of time to read the OSL specification, you can create your own. And that's the beauty of it. I mean, yes, this OSL took a long time to get it, but it's here and it's working and it opens the, the shading possibilities for Redshift to a completely different level. Nice. I, any I any chance you could share that GitHub address? Could you post it in the chat section in the webinar? Yeah, I'll you... I'll do that just now. Uh, actually, I, I think I have even an example I made a few uh, days ago about how you can, you know, the box shader where you can have uh, a shader put on a flat plane, and you turn the camera around and you look through the plane, and it's a you're inside the box, so you can do buildings and things like this. Oh, without having yeah, to model the parallax, the parallax exactly, shader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's cool. 
that works just fine. Let me uh... let me send you the screen, the screen, Adrian, so you can share your screen. Oh, oh. Uh, hang on. Reshift GitHub. No, not this one. Don't know if I'm sharing anything. I've just I've just sent the screen. Oh, screen. Yeah, I'm I'm still on a 4K, I think. Uh, let me just Redshift GitHub. Oh come on, there you go. Okay, so we have a lot of shaders Not here. Your screen yet, Adrian? Can you see my screen? No, that no. Nope. Should have a little pop-up no. box just to select. Show screen. There we go. Now we can see cinema. So it's GitHub Redshift 3D Redshift OSL shaders. Okay, I can I can actually copy and paste this in here and send to all. And you can see we have well quite a bunch of them, I think. And um, from simple things, I think I I wrote some of them. Uh, for instance, let's say you have a 3D noise, a black body, which to be honest, there are some some are really super simple, like this one, for instance, right? Uh, let me hide this. So what it is, it's a vector radiance that it calls a black body function with the Kelvin, you divide it by pi, and then you normalize the radiance of the alpha by intensity. Nothing really complicated. Probably for guys that are not into math at all, that might look scary, but you know what? You don't need to know all this. Just mm -hmm. get a shader from the list and have fun with it. Mm -hmm. As simple as that. I mean, look, star fields, new. Um, I have, we have an Ishita, I think, uh, sky, a new sky model. Uh, marble shaders, this window template, window box, uh, flakes, whatever. I mean, and you can write your own. I mean, I. One of the things that bothered me was, for instance, that I had to actually uh, get a C4D shader to create a, uh, a checker box, right? So, you know, if you have, for instance, let's create a material, right? Just a simple material. By the way, I'm not into Node Editor because of some limitations. So um, you could have gone to C4D on the see for the shader right and then you go to shader uh, surfaces get a checkerboard right well i don't want to bake this i want to make it directly so why not write an oyster shader so this is quite simple and there's no showing off let me just show you this here Okay, you can decide, define some, uh, let me just put this into open shading language. These are parameters, for instance, right? This is the shader declaration, parameters, 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 and then you get some U, some V from the surface. If you want to transform it a bit, yes, you can. And then you say, well, if this value is smaller, then put that. If that value is bigger, then put the other one. As simple as that, you know, if you don't have to do anything and you just, uh, let me get, if I can, if this is not, come on. I also want to say real quick that the uh, implementation that you guys, that uh, the Redshift team did for OSL here in, in the node is is really forgiving. Um, so you don't have to uh, deal directly with text as Adrian is. Um, you can also just download a file and load a file. And then, yeah. uh, so, you know, it's, uh, it's very flexible like that. So for instance, we have this DOM, okay? And I have a checkerboard shader. Well, it's, it's, this is not a really big complicated, and you know what? You can get a ton of OSL shaders. For instance, Autodesk Max ships 120 of them, okay? And they're free on GitHub. So for instance, the one I wrote, it's not super complicated. It has a few, uh, I was trying to kind of mimic what Maya does. And you can have, for instance, a center if you want. You can have repeats. You can scale it up and down and so on and so forth. These are things that you can do yourself. And you know what? You just change something in the code. You make them from plus, you make it minus or multiply or divide. 
<laughs> and things are completely different. And you go like, wait, I can write my own things just like with simple math. Yeah, this doesn't actually require a really a deep understanding. It's you're tinkering with simple math. And if you need to, yes, you can go really further in, but it's it's just fun. I mean, okay, let's say this is not uh, fantastic, and to be honest, it's quite simple. But uh, let's say I have um, yeah, this one. It's nice, for instance, uh, a three D grid. No biggie. It's it just takes some object point in space, and then you say again, it's a conditional, right? And then it's bigger, smaller, and so on and so forth, and you can have it space. There you go. It's amazing. Um, I, yeah, I've got I mean, a question. Is it, is it um, as fast as the hard-coded hard notes um, in Redshift or do we have yeah. some impact on speed or? No, because no, 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 no. Because these internally are translated into Redshift code. That's amazing. Okay? It, it, it takes a few seconds to compile this into Redshift code, and then that's that. I mean, yeah, the whole point of Redshift is keeping performance. Yeah. There are some parameters that I, I in one of the first releases of the uh, OSL shader, I recall reading that there were some um, parameters that were not supported. Is, is that still the case? uh we don't support derivatives for instance like uvs right we don't support volume shaders in osl right now and there are also a few uh, a few things like this but to be honest if you're smart enough to miss derivatives and volume <laughs> shaders probably can work around <laughs> at math level you know <laughs> but this opened the the whole thing to a, a completely new level uh, Let's, uh, I don't even know what to, what to show you guys, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know any of wow. that syntax or any of those, you know, like, I don't know, like what string is a um, uh, matrix or you know, whatever. Um, but I do know that I can download an OSL file and load it in the OSL shader and I can get a totally new uh, look and behavior in a material that I otherwise would not be able to do. Exactly, and as I said, the, the the really fun part is that you can get the code right and start changing this plus minus and multiply divide and see what it does. I mean, otherwise you can't. It's, it's just it's just fun in the end. Probably when you're in production and you have your producer breathing down your back and your the director and asking for the final result and so on and so forth. Yeah, maybe you don't have that. But if you want to experiment with with things that are not available apparently. Yes, you can. And there are a lot of people writing shaders. I mean, there's an, uh, I think there's an Autodesk. Also, Ooh, could would this be a solution to get the um, the color data into the Redshift light or no? Oh no, no, no. This uh, the, the color data is even simpler than. Oh, I, I closed it. Let me show you. I don't know if you can see the screen properly because this is a 4K screen. I don't know. Maybe I can make it smaller. No. And I let me see. see. see the whole it, it, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna grab a light. Okay. Just a simple light. Where's that area light? Okay. Let me make it sphere visible. Okay. Cloner and an effector. We don't support user data on lights, so that was the problem. So you okay. get a random something, you turn that off, effect our color. All you have to do is go here and click blend object color. Ah, oh. that was. And I, look, okay. I looked at that parameter and I was like, "Is it, I should try that?" But then I just got into the notes that, and I didn't even that's try. That's an it. actual hack. It's an actual hack and it works. It's just fun. Awesome. I mean, yeah, and I think you can change the uh, seed. Yeah. Yeah. That so is very cool. I very actually, I, I, answer, I answer this on the, uh, on the go to webinar questions here somewhere. Ah, 
thank you. So yeah, it's it, but it's 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 two steps. Inject some random colors and then simply just blend object color. That's it. You so don't need to do a shader graph. Yeah. No, I see. Oh yeah, it's 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 it, it's fun. Uh, I'm gonna try to find for you that example with the with the box because it's amazing. And by the way, with OSL you can support um, ACES. So one of the biggest issue we have with ACES, we don't have direct support for textures with ACES, but OSL allows you to write a bit of code. You write a matrix for colors and it does a, a color transform and you get your sRGB or EXR or whatever colors space you have into ACES and you render that and that works. And probably, of course, I probably don't have all this right now because, well, it's a mess. Uh, GB box. Well. And I think let's, because let's, so let's, many let's continue people... on. instead of looking at me trying to find the file. Let's continue with anything else. So I'll, I'll yeah. get back and I'll show you this. We we do have um, some other questions as well that are jumping in. I've got one one eye on the clock, and it's we'll probably slightly overrun if you need to, to leave at the top of the hour. But there's a couple of questions I think that will be interesting just to get everyone's opinion on. The first one is Paul earlier on wanted to know about the M1 chip, and this is related to a question that Trip just asked. So Paul's question was: Have any of the team run the Mac version on the Apple Silicon M1? chip and that's both redshift and cinema and if so what was the performance and then trip was asking do you notice that you were showing your track material Jonas in a mac os environment and was one is in the market for a new machine and that the the very very important question which particular operating system should he pick or was he considering a pc is it better to go for a mac and the answer absolutely i can predict that we all say is it depends um, Absolutely. And the the simple, we'll get into the technical aspect of that um, directly, Trip. I suppose the simple answer is the ecosystem in which you uh, in which you live, and what other things you need to connect with it. I know that uh, many people who use both Redshift and Cinema use it with um, towers like Del, um, the Darren's got a Dell tower with a 3080 card in it, and that's working um, very well for him. I know Lionel uses a 3090 card, so in, Nvidia GPUs on, on PCs are very popular, but the, the aspect of being able to do it on a Mac is also very useful because you're using an eGPU, Jonas, aren't you? Yes, yes, I've got a Sonnet box with uh, Radeon Pro uh, W5700 in it. And um, yeah, I'm I'm happy with it. So the, the speed is amazing. I mean, it's for me, it's the only way to like use Redshift on my MacBook Pro. So the, the setup is a MacBook Pro plus the eGPU. Um, but I'm really happy with it. So I don't uh, realize any any speed problems, um, once it's connected, it works like a charm. I'd love to get Vanessa's take on this because um, he's been new, he's he's an established Mac user for many years, but you've recently um, been testing things out on the PC, haven't you? Oh yes, I'm <clears throat> extremely happy and uh, thankful to Dell that uh, you know tried to convince me to go and switch. Uh, and of course, uh, is Apple one of our partners? Um, I don't think officially, no. Okay, because they've uh, totally dropped the ball the last uh, 12 years, 15, something like that. I've been using Mac since 1985. A lot of people were not born, born back then. And I'm terribly disappointed on the pro support. So I'll change my mind if Apple becomes a partner or sends me a computer my way, just saying here. But uh, yeah, I'm very happy with uh, the computer. Technology is moving fast. PCs are, you know, the, the quality, the build quality. Um, is outstanding and if someone's on a budget and like to tinker you can build your own PC you know with uh, pennies and you have a monster literally a monster machine uh, much cheaper than it will cost you to get a, a Mac. On the other hand the other one thing I won't ever get used to is the ecosystem um, you know the Mac operating system is a much more you know, easy system to use and I'm happy that there is the option for Mac users now to use um, Redshift. 
So, you know, that's my overall my overall view, and hopefully, you know, um, I'll have a chance to play on the Mac version when someone donates a very powerful Mac my way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any, to answer your question earlier on, I don't think any of, any of us have used the M1 chip on Redshift just yet, but um, as, as and when we do, then we'll absolutely let you, let you know what our results were. Um, another question I wanted to squeeze in, um, Drake's got an interesting question about rendering settings, and he's been a fan of the AIexterior.com website where they do <coughs> almost hyper real renders which are based a lot on the textures and photogrammetry as well as other techniques and i think the overriding question so forgive me drake if i'm not asking asking this correctly but the question was how would the team uh, play with the the setup if they were really interested in getting very photorealistic or even hyper realistic renders as any of the go-to settings that you would uh, tip i can take that assignment if you want because okay. it's a very 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 simple answer and uh, can you allow me to share my screen if you don't mind? yes absolutely here we go make you the presenter so Show my screen and hopefully it's the right screen. It is right. So is my screen being shared now? Yes, it is. Yes. So uh, here we have a uh, very well known Emily. And my question to Drake is, does she feel real? Uh, if she does, that has nothing absolutely to do with render setting. These are, these are my stock render settings. And this is fairly quick to render. You're seeing the real time rendering right now. So she's going to switch around for a bit. There you go. This is the real time rendering. It's all about the raw assets. This particular project, which if you search for digital Emily, you will be able to get the model, the textures. Um, the reason why this looks so good and it looks like a real human has nothing, absolutely zero to do with render settings. It has to do with the quality of the original assets. Uh, this young lady was put in a machine with many hundreds of cameras and she was scanned and they scan her specularity. If you go to that website, that shows the whole process that was done. It's absolutely uh, a great you know, uh, insight into the technology of uh, scanning, uh, 3D scanning and, and uh, even especially for humans. And they're doing it now for moving humans as well. And um, this is the absolute showcase that render settings make no difference. You can go here. I'm going to switch this to basic and I'm going to set my redshift to low. And this is what we get. This is low, right? What you saw before was just, you know, not very low. But this is exactly what you get. And it has nothing to do with render settings. So just put the render settings to control your speed mostly. And everything else has to do with the quality of the assets. IX Ponza does great work when it comes to photogrammetry. Uh, they go and uh, take uh, thousands of photographs of the rocks you see, of the plants, of the trees, of the buildings, and it's all, they put in hundreds of hours of processing those images to create the textures, the normal maps, the specular maps, the uh, albedo maps, and all that. And that is the number one and the only important thing uh, when you're considering making something which is hyper real. Have a very good fundamental basis where you get your, uh, your data from. And that's all I have to say on this subject. How, what would you be your approach on if you were um, doing non-humans, like say environmental stuff, um, like rock or glass and so on? Would that be a, a similar approach? Okay, I mean, glass is a totally different thing. You, the only data you can get for glass is the surface itself, and it's very difficult to do photogrammetry. But in uh, talking about other diffuse things like rocks uh, or trees or uh, buildings, um you you can use photogrammetry now which i think that unreal um epic games uh, acquired a company uh, if i'm not mistaken cre create oh someone can fill me in on that and uh, what you basically do what photogrammetry is for anyone that doesn't know it's a, a technique where you use a camera you start taking photos of something either an area or a particular object from as many angles as you can some of these uh, sessions uh, can be more than a thousand photographs and each photograph has a different part of your object 
or environment. What happens then, special software takes these photographs and finds the overlapping elements. They use these amazing algorithms and they can um, create a huge panorama. Just like we stitch photographs when we're creating a 360 panorama in Photoshop, for example. Um, this does the opposite. It actually stitches them around what you're doing. And when it's created that, uh, let's say, 360 image, if you're moving around something, you see all the aspects of it. And you, in your mind, you say, oh, now I know how this thing looks. Well, the computer does the same thing. They put this uh, through some algorithms and it extracts the geometric data, uh, just like we do camera tracking, for example, where each frame of our movie we find those markers and then everything all together, a computer can calculate how the camera is moving. This is a similar technique, but it actually calculates the shape of the object. And then you get not only the actual model, very high density model of the object, but it actually extracts the material of the object for every one of those shots. So you get a, a, uh, a material that fits exactly to the model. Now, there are other ways where you can use special filters so that um, in a, if you're outside and you shoot in your rock, you can use polar, uh, polarized filters and you do another session with those polarized filters and you can only shoot the reflections or the specular. And you have the ability, again, you, it's very, very enlightening if you go, you look for Digital Emily and find the page that shows the whole story because it does have images of how a human looks if you shoot with a very specific polarized filter where everything is black and the only thing that is shiny is where you have moisture on your surface. And because moisture reflects more, you can use that in the specular channel. This is one of the things I've used for this particular image where her, her cheeks and the top of her lips are a bit more shiny and uh, so forth. And uh, th this is one of the new emerging technologies. A lot of companies are uh, using these technologies to create these amazing assets. And uh, yeah, a lot of information out there and have nothing to do with render settings, uh, I have to repeat. <laughs> TJ um, did some research for you, or knew this already, Reality Capture, and that's at capturingreality.com is the site. Mm -hmm. And also Quixel is fantastic for this as well, mm -hmm. of course. Um, the two, two quick questions to round up, because we're a little over time, so think of us. One is, just a quick follow-up on that, Thanasis, is I know you just said it's not to do with the render settings, but is there anything, if you were tweaking stuff that you'd do differently in Redshift than you would do in Cinema? Um, in, in what regards, tweaking? In, in terms what? to extend, extending this idea of getting mm -hmm. a more photoreal or hyper-realistic render. Um, just try and uh, not exceed what is considered, you know, physically plausible, right? When when light bounces off an object, we don't get more light back unless it's radioactive, you know, for example. But um, trying to uh, sort of can do things as close as possible to how things work in the real world, and uh, realism is uh, in the eye of, of the viewer. If anything, um, for example, the uncanny valley when it comes to digital humans is because our brain is very good at distinguishing uh, that there's something wrong, especially with faces. And uh, sometimes we don't know what's wrong, but our brain is telling us there's something wrong about this. And although, you know, when we look at the cartoons, we don't get that sense. So if we're looking at a stylized motion graphics, render with a lot of shiny things and weird cubes moving around nowhere uh, our brain is being instructed that this is a representation of the real world that's why we we can perceive it with uh, you know without feeling uncomfortable but when you see a digital human or you see a rock or a tree and uh, realism around it when you created that scene is not represented very accurately you may not be able to identify where the problem is, but your brain is firing and saying, there's something wrong with this, you're not feeling well, you're sick, you get dizzy, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but trying to adhere to the, the, the rules of uh, nature, uh, what I tell people when I do training sessions is that all you have to do is look at the world around you and start asking questions. Why does this look this way? Why do specular highlights 
uh, why are specular highlights more bright on the rounded edges of objects? It's like uh, your, your rear view mirrors in the car, because it makes things look smaller. So if you have a huge light and in a metal object or a plastic object, which has a round element, that big light becomes smaller because your mirror is uh, uh, convex. Um, the light reflection gets condensed, but the intensity is the same. So you get the same amount of light you get in a big surface, but you get it from a small surface. Hence, it makes it appear brighter. So these are the kind of things, you know, if you look around uh, your, uh, you know, outside or on your desk, you'll find all sorts of things. I've found this uh, bicycle light the other day and I repurposed it. It works fine. And oh, I'm looking at the that one? Sorry? You didn't print that one? No, 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 I don't print everything. I, I just gather <laughs> rubbish, which still works. And gather, it, grab anything, your mouse, a pen, um, some gum, a, 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 an eraser, a pencil eraser. I still use pencil and paper, by the way. And, and see, look at it and see, okay, why is the, the plastic shiny? Put it against the light, change the color of the light, um, turn your dimmer if you have a dimmer, down and see how it re uh, reacts. That's the only way you can get a better sense of how things work and by understanding the difference between how light behaves, because it's all about light, right? How light behaves on different surfaces, uh, then you will be able to replicate that by just applying uh, common sense. So it's all about observation, right? Nothing else. Excellent. That's a great point, actually. Absolutely. Um, thank you for everyone for bearing with us for slightly running over time. Got time for one more tiny quick question, which I thought would be interesting for Adrian. Jeremiah has asked about Redshift implementing a toon shader. Oh, that's a good one. It's on Rob's to-do list. He's going to do it. Okay. <laughs> you heard it here first, Jeremiah. <laughs> there we go. But, 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 but you can do things up to a proper tune shader yourself. I posted a video some three years ago about how to create non-photorealistic rendering using a, a cross product between the light vector and the surface normal, which actually is just a Lambert shader that you can then remap and get, uh, you know, the shading just uh, if you want compressed. Uh, you can do things with OSL shader for instance, like a half tune um, shader. There are many things that you can do, especially that OSL is right now integrated into Redshift. And just to show you this, I don't know if I can do this. Oh, we can. I, I was about to wrap up. We'll, we'll run over a couple of minutes. I hope you don't mind, everyone. Sure. Let's just make you a presenter then. I also found okay. the link to the video, which I'm going to paste into the chat. Oh, OK. Can you we see my screen? Include, that, no, include links that we've mentioned, by the way, in the YouTube descriptions when we post the recording shortly. We don't see your screen yet, Adrian. Okay, show my screen. Because someone Can made me the presenter. Here okay. we go. Okay, so Works. I have this, this simple plane here, right? As you can see here, it's a plane, right? How about this? What? Yeah. Parallax shaders are awesome. Yeah. Yes. So cool. Okay. And actually what I did with this scene was building a sort of skyscraper. Well, just having fun with it, to be honest. Okay. Not this one. This one from was from another example. Uh, I think it's this one. And this one, it's a bit huge. Because um, I started with that, that and then... <laughs> What you see here are just boxes, okay? I boxes the as shader, right? And if I start rendering it, there's a, this huge cylinder with a really about 26 or 28K image of some city just to integrate this a bit. And hopefully this will start rendering. There you go, okay? And these are boxes, nothing else, okay? It's, it's just one shader, actually. They're, a few of them and there's a uh, there's a maxon noise that's actually switching these or even user data and you can 
if I get this kind of like, oops, so in this position and you're tweaking it, it's not quite far from what you get, right? I mean, yes, it's a bit of noise, a bit of this, a bit of that, and you can get close and move around the building and every single thing that's inside that shader can be different. Now you're saying, that. Adrian, it's a box, but is it? Yeah, I'm saying it's a it's a box shader, right? right it's right, it's right. a it's, it's just a, a flat poly actually. Exactly. And if you're looking if you're looking at all this, hopefully, probably won't work because it uses the cloner to guess all this. But it's basically this this little come on. Come here. <laughs> Just as a side note, you can actually replicate this shader um, in Cinema 4D standard render without OSL uh, using the material nodes. It's not simple, but it's no. um, yeah, it's one of those amazing uh, techniques. As you can see now, what Adrian is showing, you get the sense of 3D, where in fact the, the 3D effect is calculated by the shader by calculating the angle of the camera on the plane, and this shows you know, how powerful the system can be if you're willing to put in, you know, the, the, the time and the effort. Yeah, it's Actually, especially I great for... This. I just got it from the internet. Mm -hmm. That's as <laughs> simple as that. I mean, okay. And what the shader does is actually modifying the UVs of the texture, actually of the plane, so it catches a different UV based on the camera. That's all. I mean, it's very clever, really. And you can do this with with really uh, big instances of of buildings, and just to vary a bit the contents of the buildings. It's I find it really amazing that you can do these kind of things really fast, and we can support in Redshift. Yeah, and the the cool thing about this is uh, you cannot just have one room per plane, but you can also have like a grid of rooms just on one plane. We had that example. Um, what Thanasis just um, mentioned. Uh, with Cinema 4D R20 when our um, node-based materials came out and one of our beta testers created um, a, a, well an exterior shader for buildings where um, there were multi multiple windows and the facade and um, w when you just moved the camera along this plane you had a whole facade of a house and this is like incredibly useful for like bigger VFX shots when you like have a camera fly through New York and like something, a little bit of destruction, it doesn't matter. If you fly through yeah. all of these skyscrapers and so on, you don't want to have all of these geometry inside of the buildings because that would be overkill. But if you have that yeah, you on a shader basis, yeah, when you have that on a shader basis, you can fly through um, the streets and you will have the parallax inside or behind the windows that you need in order to sell the shot. Because if you don't have that, if you're just using plain images, although yeah, there might be a fast flat. camera move, you will notice it. It's exactly this uncanny valley thing that Thanasis um, mentioned earlier, uh, just with um, with architecture and perspective. Um, but it's basically the same thing, and this uh, can save a lot of um, render trouble. I gotta say, Adrian just did a really subtle but very cool thing. The thing is that uh, each side of this, uh, each side, each wall of this room, this virtual room, um, a, a texture is chosen for it. And um, so there aren't actually lights, but Adrian just hit something and made it appear as if uh, he could turn yeah, up the lighting it, in this one room. It's just the intensity on, on the actual shader. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a brightness, let's say, right? So yeah. parameter. Yeah, I mean, it's this, subtle, but it's cool. Exactly. And the thing is, you can have many of these. I mean, you're not restricted to one. Like I, I have here, I have six because I had six images already made and a shader, shader switch. And then I decided to change this based on the maximum noise that I have here. And then, you know, just have fun with it. I mean, yeah, the, the whole point is we're in a cheating business. <laughs> yeah. We're trying to get to get images rendered, but we need to make it so colossally big and complex the scene 
sometimes you cannot render. So you're gonna cheat in every single possible way. And I find this absolutely amazing. In the end, it doesn't have to be right. It has to look right. Yeah. Exactly. Correct. That's yeah. the mantra. Yeah. You can, if, if you can sell the shot, that's perfect. You're done. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. Sorry, sorry about all this OSL thingy, but it's it's something that not so many people know about, and it's something that we've put so much effort into it to open the shading system for people so they can really have flexibility. And and it's really awesome. I mean, um, if you could point us to to more um resources where we can download OSL shaders, uh, I think that would be cool for for um our yeah. audience here. Uh, we have, have our have own it. GitHub where we've <laughs> tested the shaders and those work because every DCC has the OSL implemented up to a point, to be honest. Um, you can see that, for instance, Arnold doesn't build the UI. The shader works, right? But it doesn't build the UI nicely. We're trying to do both to build a, a nice UI, but you, you see here you have Q. And this is a spinner, right? This is not nice. I rather have <laughs> something like a, a float slider, right? Where it's just usability. And we're trying to do both. See, this mid, this mid tones, this is something way uh, better for a user to have than this skew spinner. Mm -hmm. I can have to, you know, all these things matter. And we try to do both the nice flexible UI and the good code. So the code is fast and it's efficient and it does what it should be doing. Now, we're not completely done with OSL. We still have a few things, but what we have works, okay? And for these shaders that we have, for instance, um, Autodesk ships with Max, just to show you this, ships with about 100 OSL shaders that you can try. And it's not that um, they're proprietary or anything. Eh? You see here, there's 153 files. Okay, uh, you can have fun going through all of these. Some might work, some might not. Okay, we've kind of run through these and we've got those that are interesting. But these Redshift shaders, uh, OSL shaders are on the web. They're free for everyone. The same thing with the... Um, Autodesk OSL shaders. And if you do a OSL, uh, an OSL search on Google, you're gonna find up, uh, find uh, probably quite a few sites that are offering OSL shaders. Of course, not everything will work straight out of the box. And to give you an example, um, just go through Octane and see if all their shipped OSL shaders work. We found that that's not the case. Some of their own OSL shaders are breaking with their own code, right? So yes, we can do the same, you know, just grab some OSL shaders from everywhere and then, you know, ship it. But we like to test things before saying, yes, this is working or not. Maybe that worked for uh, when they shipped on that version and something else, something changed after, and it might have broken something in the code. I don't know, but yeah, you can find shaders and if you're really into, you can even go and read the specification. I'm sorry to say that, guys. This is not an advice for <laughs> probably for, for artists. But you know what? Once you get inside of this, you can't get out. It's, it's, it's really <laughs> catchy. It's like, you're wait, trapped. wait, exactly. I can do that? Oh, wait, there's no shader that can do that. You know? Oh, I can build my own? Wait a minute, this is really, really interesting. Yes, exactly, you're trapped and you... It's not easy to say, well, there's nothing I can do. Well, yeah, you can do it, just, you know, you can ask people for help. You don't, it's not like, oh, you can do it or not. It's so really you're, now, you're now an OSL addict. Yeah, totally. <laughs> All right. This is if great I have stuff. time, I'll, I'll, I'll just have fun with OSL because you can do amazing things. And the nicest thing is uh, now, uh, because Redshift is uh, OSL compatible, we're working with closures. Now, previously we didn't work with closures and we had our own shaders kind of like black boxes, but now we're like 
OSL and closure is kind of a, a result of a radiance uh, compute. And you can split reflections, refraction, diffuse, uh, diffuse lighting and so on, and then, then recombine those, right? In a traditional shader, what you can do, you can say, okay, this is component and that's that. Well, maybe I can want to divide, I want to divide them or add them or not necessarily multiply them. And all of these things open the doors to a completely new way of thinking about shading. Really, I don't want to get you um, excited or bored with this, but yeah, it's uh, it's something that's, uh, hmm. Now I really have something that I can do and not necessarily go like, can you please write a shader for me? Well, you know, now you're gonna do things like, uh, can you help me out with this, please? I'm reminded but, of yeah. that one liner that they used to say oh, there's an app for that now it's there's a shader for that <laughs> there's a node <laughs> there's, there's a framework now <laughs> available yeah, yeah. it's I, I think i think that is the one of the biggest things that we we've done so far really it's a huge endeavor it Very took cool. a while it took a while but yeah it it just opened the doors to to completely new horizons yep I'm going to grab the screen back. This this is amazing Please. stuff, Adrian. We will continue on this theme because there, there's a lot to unpick here. So thank you for, for let, letting us overrun for this. I thought it was very it interesting. Was so it's a, it a worthwhile thing. And so we'll we'll pick it up on it. On the, the events page that I'm showing now, we are just showing some of the things that are coming up. And we're looking at the more Cinema 4D, S24, and visualization techniques on Monday. And But also, you can see here on the events page, we're featuring more things over the coming months. So in May, we're looking at fantasy, futuristic, fake, whatever that stands for, but FUI graphics um, over a course of four, se uh, four sessions in May, looking at the Red Giant tools and cinema, how we can create those. And we've also got a month dedicated to Redshift in June. So we're going to be definitely extending this theme. And just in case you missed it at the beginning, we're recording this. You can find the recording on the Maxon training team on the YouTube channel, and the recording will be available in the next couple of hours. And we'll add the links in, especially some of the ones that Adrian was just talking about. And we'll put those in the description. And apologies if we didn't get around to answering uh, your specific question, because that's part of the nature of these sessions. They're the unstructured interactivity. So it's uh, that's part of the beauty of it. But also it sometimes means we don't get it to everything. But if you've got a question, please come to one of the future Ask the Trainer sessions or contact us, training at maxon.net. That comes through to us and we're delighted to hear from you. And also the whole point of these sessions is that they're prompted by your questions. And that's why we're doing the um, the FUI graphics in May because we've got so many questions about it. And that's why we're running Redshift in June. So please be, keep in contact with us. We love to hear from you. And it also inspires the actual content that we investigate. So this is brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and um, thank you for the suggestions as well for future themes. And thank you to all our panel. Thank you for taking this time and for letting us put you on the spot with <laughs> unprompted questions. Brilliant. It's okay. Fun. Thank you so much, yes, Adrian. Fun. That was yes, just exactly. awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I'm now going Sorry, straight. I, 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 thought I, I hope I wasn't too, too aggressive. No, no, it's perfect. <laughs> it's all cool. I mean, you know a lot. Yeah, always good to share all of that stuff. Yeah, cool. We'll see you all Bye. next time. All right, take care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Cheers.